Just this way. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Chris Baker, and I have to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, I think a lot of you will know Nicola. He has been in Thailand since 2003, when he first started out as a teaching French. You know, that's how you get started. And since then, he's been through several degrees, uh, both here and at Paris Sorbonne. Um, and he has become, I guess, one of the new wave of these early historians, historians of early Southeast Asia. The, 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 the research that he is going to talk about tonight will be also published in the next issue of JSS, which will co come, come out. I've promised you already, sir. Uh, which will come out in uh, May or June around then. So, Nicola, thank you. Thank you very much. Merci. Uh, thank you, Chris. A very good evening to you all. Can you hear me well? OK. Thank you. <coughs> um, OK, so just as Chris uh, mentioned, uh, this, is draw this presentation today, which I will try to make it uh, easy and straightforward for people who are not in the field of early uh, history and archaeology. Uh, to give you the main points, but for more details and reference, you uh, hopefully will read some more very soon in a GSS. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, presentation today is divided into four parts. I will start with discussing the uh, <clears throat> some of the recent publications and discoveries made in uh, southern Thailand, in the province of Krabi. Klong Tom is one of the early uh, sites in Krabi province. And uh, as you will see very soon, uh, <coughs> recent uh, reading on the rivers of golden coins seem to read a name which will be, we can uh, interpret as being Vishnu, the god Vishnu, Valman, protected by or uh, armor of Vishnu. So this is uh, obviously uh, a royal name, I would claim, a ro local ruler. So that is a new important discovery. And then uh, my interest when I read that in GSS basically about a year ago, I think it was published, uh, that article, <clears throat> when I so that then uh, I became very interested in tracing, you know, uh, whatever we can uh, trace about Vishnu Valman, so-called, in uh, first in Jambudwipa, that is the Indian subcontinent, India, basically, India and Northwest India, and then see if there are early uh, evidence for an, some Vishnu Valman, kings or prince in what we call in Sanskrit Sulvanadwipa or the Golden Islands or Golden Peninsula, including Southern Thailand and the Malay Peninsula and uh, perhaps further afield in uh, maritime uh, Southeast Asia. And in the end, I found there is actually another reference to Vishnu Valman further south in today Malaysia from as we see, the mid-first millennium. And so the question arises to me whether uh, this Vishnu Valman that we have here, uh, uh, it seems from Klongtom, Krabi, could be related in any way to the other Vishnu Valman that we know of in Malaysia, whether it is about all about one or maybe two different Vishnu Valman. And I will come some, with some conclusion here. So, First, the uh, recent publications and studies on uh, a hoard of gold coins that have been found uh, actually many years ago, maybe uh, three to four decades, I think, in the late 70s, early 80s, it was found uh, in Klongtom, Krabi province. The site 
Klong Tom is also the name of the river. It's the name of a district and it's the name of the river there. And the site is also known to early historians and archaeologists as Kwan Lukpat. Kwan, probably hill, can be translated as hill. And Lukpat in Thai would be beads. So beads, mounds will be the translation for that site, simply because it's, it's a hill. And on that, that hill, many early beads have been found over the decades. And some of these material, beads, seals, and early uh, artifacts that date back from the early first century's common era, uh, some of these uh, material are now collected and kept in the local museum. There is a Wat, Wat Klong Tom. If you ever visit that place, there is a local museum. It's been recently renovated. It's quite nice to visit with good explanation in both Thai and English. But this is only part, uh, the tip of the iceberg, because most of this material actually is, uh, has been disseminated and uh, um, circulated mostly in private collections in Thailand and perhaps abroad. And so is the case with most of these gold coins. Being gold, of course, it's been looted and um, disseminated in many, many places. A few early studies uh, from the 80s, 1980s, by some scholars had the chance to work on pictures and photographs. And so some uh, publications already from the early 80s. And um, more recently, by a German archaeologist who I know is a friend of mine, Brigitte Borel, who is also a regular contributor in GSS, has published uh, first in 2017 gold coins from Klong Tom. So this is the first of a series because then she published some updates up till last year. And so she, uh, in her most recent uh, study, of the material, she categorizes, she does typology of coins, so there are various kinds. And the first group, which she called group A in her typology, is this type. So on the obverse, you find what she called a head in profile. And on the reverse, some letters. And for many, many years, up till recently, no one could read what it was. And actually, it was not even published. So this, this is the, the same. This coin here, obverse, reverse, is the only one that is today on display at Wat Klong Tom in situ. And, uh, but it's on display only on the obverse, so you don't get to see the back, the reverse. And so for many years, people, scholars, could not really study this material, did not have access, first-hand photographs of the back. And uh, many speculations, uh, people were discussing, uh, thinking that maybe this is an import from India, maybe from Rome, as far as Rome. So there's many open questions here. Up till more recently, with the study of Brigitte Borel, who, with, uh, who having access to more private collections here in Thailand, actually find out that there are more of this type. And these are two more fragments here that are known to us. So this is the obverse, the reverse. And this one is only a fragment, half of it. And the same type, a head in profile, even though it's rather blurred and uh, worn. And on the back, it seems some um, uh, what we call in Sanskrit akshara or axon letters, uh, about six of them circular, and again, no one could really read it, okay? Now, uh, Brigitte Borel, a German archaeologist, uh, did uh, ask the assistance of a very prominent German epigraphist who deal with Indian inscriptions, mainly, and his name is Harry Folk, Professor Folk from Germany, who has a great experience about uh, reading uh, ancient inscriptions of India and Pakistan and all that. So Professor Folk was able to guess a reading here on these 
on the back, on the reverse of these uh, three identical coins. And his reading was Shri, first given as Shri Vishuvagoda. So Shri, Sri in Thai, you probably know, is a prefix to uh, usually for kings, for gods, or auspicious uh, names. And, and then some kind of Indic language. We could not quite say this is Sanskrit, but close to it. So if you're familiar with Prakrit, the language, Prakrit is a derived, it's an Indic, Middle Indic language, Middle, Ar Middle Aryan Indic language, close to Sanskrit, but Sanskrit is perfect, you see. Prakrit is derived, so it's like Pali. Pali is a kind of Prakrit as well, okay? And so uh, Professor Folk uh, uh, identified the script, the shape of the letter as what we call Brahmi letters from southern India, probably quite early Brahmi script. The language being some Prakrit. There are many types of Prakrits, but let's say generically a Prakrit. So not like pure Sanskrit, but a Prakrit. And uh, both Professor Folk and I think um, Brigitte Borel, the archaeologist, um, assumed that this was not actually import coins, but probably produced locally at Krongtom in Krabi sometime in the early centuries. So that was the first uh, conclusion. And the dating was given as, of course, uh, approximately given as anywhere in the second to third century common era. Although, quote, in the article they say, because this is not absolute dating, there is no date, and it was not found in archaeological context, so we don't have the stratigraphy and none of that. We lost the context. But, quote, although a somewhat later date may not be excluded, but certainly not later than the fifth century common era. Okay, unquote. And that is important because I will argue for, in my presentation, in the end, for a later date. So just to give you some background at Krong Tom, as part of the material that was found there, I told you, gold coins, yes, and also quite a few uh, seals. What are seals? They can be made of stone or uh, glass or some precious material. Cornelian is often, red cornelian is also something that is often uh, used to engrave inscriptions, letters. Usually short inscriptions because they are most likely given names. And these inscriptions are tentatively read here in this table. And they could be in Sanskrit, more or less pure Sanskrit, or sometimes Prakrit but all Indic, Indic coming from India. Non Pali, no Pali purely, per se, but certainly Sanskrit or Prakrit. And dating range from as early as first century BCE up to around maybe six, seven century common era. Again, nothing is absolute here. We don't have the context. There is no date, this is all relative, uh, a relative chronology based on style, based on the paleography, the shape of the um, letters. And as I will argue also, some historical context can help you uh, to perhaps give some more uh, specific dating. And so all these inscriptions on seals here are always written in mirror, in negative, because the point is for seals to be imprinted stamped onto something, perhaps to give, you know, uh, on certain objects, the name of the owner of that object. So we think, archaeologists think, that these seals were most likely the properties of some traders, merchants, and so on and so forth. The qu open question is whether these seals were owned by foreigners, Indian traders or others coming into the region, or local, uh, a local foreign residents or some other possibilities. 
we don't have a strict answer to that. But the quest question will, of course, arise again with our Vishnu Valman inscribed on those coins. So this is another example of a seal, nice one. Again, of, in translation, of Mappa. So we have only three letters here in mirror image, and they read Mappasa in Prakrit. The ending sa is a suffix in Prakrit, in Pali, or sya in Sanskrit, to denote the possession. So it's what we call the genitive case, the, the possessive case. So if I want to give my example, Nicolas Sa would be of Nicolas. Mappa would be a proper name. Someone named Mappa possessed this seal. And here there is a shape of a conch here as a symbol. Another fine example from further away in Ranong province, another early site, Bangkluenok, is a golden seal. Again, this is the original picture in negative, and this is the reverse positive image so that we can read. And the reading is Brahas Pati Shalmasa Navikasa. So this will be the name. Sa denote the position of, and navika, sa, navika is, uh, can be translated as mariner or captain. So this is the position, or this was the position of a mariner, captain, of a ship, ship captain, whose name was Brahas Pati Shalma. Shalma in uh, India is often the, 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 the suffix. Shalma often denote the Brahmin class, okay? the, the priest caste, with a symbol here in the middle. So this is a nice example, again, from a private collection. Now, back to your golden coins. Most recently, last year, in Journal of Siam Society, edited by Chris Baker, Brigitte Borel published a short update to her study with new coins coming up from private collections, as it happened, more about gold coins from Clongton. And in that short note, she published this new coin, which was unknown to us, to most of us, because it's kept in a private collection. The same type, head in profile, and an inscription on the back, which is similar to the other one, but this one is slightly better preserved. And this time, uh, Professor Folk, who works in tandem with uh, Brigitte Borel, was able to correct and revise his earlier reading, which was given as Vishu Vagoda, didn't make any much, really much sense. This time he came up with, so the first bit is the same, but the ending, importantly, now is given as Vamasa. So, Sa, again, denotes the possessive of Shri. Someone, Shri must be someone important, right? Either a king, a prince. And Vishuvama. Vishuvama, again, Prakrit, which in most likelihood is equivalent to Vishnu Valma in Sanskrit. So people are perhaps more familiar with Sanskrit than Prakrit, but it works the same. Vishu for Vishnu. Vama for Valma, Valman, in a genitive case, singular. So these are, now we know of, in total, four of these coins with the same inscription on the back. Now, so this is my starting point, and this is how I became interested in this, because there's very, as you may know, very, very few names for kings, princes from that early period, the first millennium, basically. And here we obviously have uh, an Indic name, okay? Someone named Valma, with the ending Valma, uh, is quite unique, quite rare. So I pursue my study, and here I'd like to, for your um, attention, I'd like to give perhaps three, two different, slightly different interpretation. 
So number one has already been given, perhaps equivalent to Vishnu Valman in Sanskrit, which we can translate as he who is protected by, protected by Valman, Vishnu. Vishnu, probably the, the, the god, god Vishnu. But in fact, Vishnu in Sanskrit is also all right. Uh, there is no need, in fact, to interpret it, this uh, Vishnu Valma as being Vishnu Valman. Perhaps Vishnu could simply mean he who is protected on both sides, on every quarter. Another possibility in Sanskrit would be Vishva Valman. Vishva means all around us, the universe, if you want. So anyone called, and there are ex examples uh, in early India of kings named Vishnu Valman, these kings are protected by all around them. Actually, Vishnu, in translation, means the all pervader. And Vishva Rupa, Rupa, the form of Vishva, is a form, one of the form of Vishnu as well. So all in all, there is no contradiction between these different interpretations. Okay, so these are just some linguistics possibilities, but it all more or less means the same. Someone who is protected by the surrounding. Now, for uh, historians, more interesting perhaps is to try to learn more about this figure, historical figure. Was he a local prince, king, possibly? We know from other examples that most people named Valman were mostly kings or princes. Not always. I will show you some few exceptions, but most of the time. So that would be quite important, historically speaking. We would have, for once, a name of a king or a ruler, a prince in a region from the first millennium in southern, southern Thailand. And if he was a ruler, what was his more or less territory, his sphere of influence, and his dates? Of course, was he, was he a ruler in the second century, third, fourth, fifth, sixth? All these are, of course, historical questions. And as I started to pursue uh, for other occurrences of Vishnu Valman, known Vishnu Valman, first, first off, first thought is we know of no Vishnu Valman in Southeast Asia. I was almost right. I should have specified mainland Southeast Asia. This is a first. But there is, as I will show you later, one more cases from further down from the Malay Peninsula. And so, in fact, we know now two Vishnu Valman in maritime Southeast Asia, or what I call the Golden Peninsula. But there are a few more occurrences in India. And so we must go back to India now for a, a brief moment. In my search, and I have been, uh, of course, asking some uh, more acquainted colleagues who deal with Indian history, Indian epigraphy, if they know of more, and this is the list of people named Vishnu Valman that we know from at least the first millennium, or even before, possibly slightly before the first millennium, common era. Number one, way back around the common era, a prince or a king, we don't really know if he, was, if he ever ruled as a king, but at least a prince named Vishnu Valman, coming from the region of ancient Gandhara, so northwest India today in Pakistan. Dated, again, more or less, not exactly, but more or less from the very late years of the first century BC to the early decades of the first century common era. So this is the first and oldest epigraphic, I should have mentioned, epigraphic on inscriptions found in Dambudwipa, so-called. And then we have a gap, seemingly, from what we know. We have a gap for a few centuries and we must move to the fifth century and more specifically around the mid-fifth century. Very interesting to find more examples of Vishnu Valman. Two, 
prince or kings, Vishnu Valman, are known from the Kadamba dynasty. For those who don't know, this is a dynasty ruling in, in the 5th, 6th century in uh, what is today Karnataka, southwest India. And so here are the dates and the details. So there's Vishnu Valman 1 and Vishnu Valman 2, possibly. And then to southeast India, in what is today Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, the Pallava dynasty, so called. A Senapati, so that is not quite a king, but a general named Vishnu Valman, is known in inscription. And he's known, and he's known to have commissioned or built uh, a temple to, guess who? Vishnu, uh, God Vishnu, uh, under uh, the auspices of uh, Pallava king, at the time around mid 5th century. And finally, the last example I could find from this period, from the first millennium, is, and I will show you a picture just after, from another, the sphere of another uh, dynasty called the Olikara kings, from a little to the north, Madhya Pradesh today, around uh, the city of Mansour, if you know. And, around the same period, we're talking about 5th century here, and this Vishnu Valman, known in inscription, does not appear to have been a king, but just a high official, perhaps a court official, and he is known as being the son of a certain Soma Valman, and that's all we know about him. And this is the picture of that seal, golden seal, again, kept in a private collection, and every time it's in gold, for some reason it's in private, private hands. Uh, published recently in a book on the Olikara kings and their inscriptions. And here is the inscription on face A in Sanskrit. So the script can be described as late southern Brahmi from the fifth century, more or less, again, relative dating. And part of an inscription here, the beginning reads Vishnu Valmasya. Sya, not sa, sya for Sanskrit, of Vishnu Valma. And then it says son of Soma Valman, and so on and so forth. And that was it. And then I could not find any more epigraphic evidence for Vishnu Valman in Indian subcontinent. There are a few references in the literature, but I will come to that later. Now turning, going back to Southeast Asia, like I said before, I didn't know of any Vishnu Valman in mainland Southeast Asia, and I was right, apparently, as far as we know. But that is not to say that we don't know any kings at all. Of course they are known from the early fifth century onwards, we know of several kings whose name are Indic, Sanskrit names, and in which the ending, the suffix, is always Valman, protected by. It becomes a custom in the early uh, Indianized king, so-called, to take the name of a god and being protected by that god. So here are some examples of Champa, Vietnam, one of the first kings that we know from inscription is known as Badra Valman. Badra is not a king, it just means auspicious. Okay? And then Jaya Valman, king of Funan, the first king of Funan that we know, historical king, that we know from inscriptions. Again, 5th century. Of course, there are many more Jaya Valman then later on in Angkorian history, especially up till Jayavaman 7, Jayavaman 8, you're familiar with those. Protected by victory. Mula Valman, Pulna Valman are some other early Indianized kings that we know of from Indonesia. Uh, Western Java, in this case, and this one, the island of Borneo. Late 5th century, early 6th century again. And many other examples. A very interesting 
case to study is Minder Ravalman. Minder Ravalman is the first king of Chenla. Chenla, ancient Cambodia, if you want. Chenla is the Chinese name that the Chinese have given to ancient Cambodia at the time, following Funan. Okay, so late 6th century, early 7th century, there is a king named Minder Ravalman. And almost the same time, perhaps preceding by just a couple of years, in India, a Pallava king named Mahindra Valman. I find this not just to be fair, you know, uh, coincidence. I think something is going on here that we don't quite understand yet. And my argument with this Vishnu Valman, also looking at what's happening in India at the time, around the 5th century, what's happening in, in Southeast Asia, I think there is a strong connection here from the 5th century, even, I would say, even mid-5th century onwards going on. It appears, for what we know, that all the Indianized kings from that time on then takes the name ending in Valman and adopting Sanskrit names. We don't know any earlier examples. Of course, there were rulers, local rulers before that, but we don't know the names directly from inscriptions being in Sanskrit, okay? Turning to Sulvanadwipa, so-called, Golden Islands or Golden Peninsula. There is one more example, as I briefly mentioned earlier which was actually excavated long time ago, many decades ago in the uh, 20th century, around the 1930s, in British Malaysia at the time. And so this is a seal, this is the original. Unfortunately, we don't know the whereabouts, stolen, lost, we don't know where it is now. We only have this old photograph from the publication. And this is the mirror image with a wax cast so that we can read. Sanskrit, Sri Valmasya, of, uh, sorry, Vishnu Valmasya, of Sri Vishnu Valman. That is the reading. And the archaeologists and scholars who have studied these uh, seals for many decades more or less agree again on the style, on the paleography, that this must be dated from 5th, 6th century, approximately, common era, okay? Cannot be earlier, cannot be much later. So this is the range. So here comes the question. Now we have this Vishnu Valma, possibly Vishnu Valman in Sanskrit, from found at Klong Tom, Krabi province, in what I would call Sanskritized Prakrit. So it's a Prakrit influenced by Sanskrit. Shri, for example, the prefix is Sanskrit. Would have been silly in correct, if there is such a word, Prakrit. Silly Vishuvama would have been the expected Prakrit, but here in this case we have Shri Vishuvama. So Sanskritized Prakrit. And we have this second seal appearing in uh, further south in Kuala Selising. This is the name of the district in today Malaysia. In what appear to be some hybrid Sanskrit. I don't want to enter into all the technical uh, details here. Uh, it's not known as pure Sanskrit. It is some kind of hybrid. So could these two figures be related? And this is the map. So here is Kwanukpat, Klong Tom, Krabi province, the border around here, today border, and further south, Kuala Selising, where the second seal was found many, many decades ago. And here in this map, I have tried to map the tentative name that we know from Chinese uh, sources from the first millennium. Uh, Chinese give us a lot of proper names, but we don't really know where this place where. We just 
trying to attribute them some uh, places. So, for example, Shito in Chinese can be translated as Red Earth, the land of Red Earth. A lot of people have written about it. Some people place Shitu here in Cambodia, some other in India, some other further south. Okay? But it seems that most recent consensus, if there is one, would seem to locate Shitu rather around here. Okay? So I just follow. This is not my, uh, my choice, but I just follow uh, experts who deal with these things. So then I will come in a minute to another. Uh, proper name known in Chinese sources as Heluodan in Chinese. Where was this kingdom of Heluodan? Again, some uh, earlier accounts would uh, think that this was in Java, Indonesia. But again, I've, having discussed the issue with many uh, experts, Chinese, who read Chinese, etc., uh, a case can be made that Heluodan was actually located on the Malay Peninsula, south of Shitu. So it all depends where you place Shitu, obviously. And further north in the peninsula, Thai Malay Peninsula, there is Pan Pan, and there is uh, Dun Sun. And again, we don't really know, but common agreement is that it was most likely located somewhere in the peninsula, rather on the Thai Upper Malay Peninsula. And others. So in red, these are the modern names, Malaysian, Keda province, Perak, Pahang, and so on. And of course, here you've got Funan and Shenla. Okay? So Chinese sources. So I have, I have tried to look at Chinese sources, whether there is something about a certain Vishnu Valman there, known in some travel accounts from the first millennium. And it appears that in the Song Chu, the book of the Song, be careful, this is the earlier, the Liu Song, not the later Song. So the earlier Song who ruled before the Tang uh, in China. So in that book, there is a mention of several missions sent from countries and kingdoms from the southern seas, that is, Southeast Asia who sent tributary missions to <coughs> China at the time, with dates and names. Great. Problem is how you interpret these names, how you read them, how, you, how do you reconstruct the names. So it appears that in those years, in the 430s, several missions were sent by a kingdom or a country named Heluodan in Chinese. We don't know what was the original name in Sanskrit or local vernacular Southeast Asian language, unfortunately. We're not even sure of the location, but I have tried to attempt to uh, place it somewhere in the Malay Peninsula. The point is that in 433 and 436, the ruler's name, king, is given as Pishabamo in Chinese characters. Pishabamo obviously is not a Chinese name. And we know from other examples that Bammo is the Chinese pronunciation for Valman. So anything Bammo is a Valman king in Sanskrit. So this is the one re earlier reconstruction that has been given by Kenneth Hall, who had uh, written about the early history of uh, maritime um, exchange in early Southeast Asia. He attempted, so the, the star here tells you this is only hypothetical reconstruction. We don't know for sure. As given this, but I have discussed the possibility with several sinologists and Sanskritists whether this is possible or not or whether Vishnu Valman is possible at all. And we came up, after discussing the issue with two great Chinese scholars here, uh, very familiar with Chinese early scriptures, that the most likely possibilities would be neither this, which doesn't mean anything in Sanskrit actually, nor 
as I would have hoped. A straightforward Vishnu Valman doesn't seem likely, but most likely Vishva Valman. But, as I think I have said at the beginning, Vishva, Vishnu, same, same, but different, as we say. It means the same, basically. In any rate, even though it may not relate to that Vishnu Valman, either the Vishnu Valman that we know from Perak, Kuala Singh, and or Vishnu Valman that we know now from Krongtom Krabi, even Another Vishva Valman is still very interesting, uh, especially as we know of concomitant contemporary examples from India, same years almost, and from the Olikara kings. So again, I find this not to be pure coincidence. Something happened at the time. Today we are dealing with text, Twitters, and Facebook. I don't know how these people communicated at the time, but it cannot happen that in India you have Vishva Valman and in Malaysia, almost a couple of years later, you have a king named Vishva Valman. And the same for Vishnu Valman. And the same for the other kings in the list, Jaya Valman, and so on and so forth. Looking at more literary sources, Indian literary sources, composed in Sanskrit, in this case. Trying to see if I can find something interesting there. I found a passage, an excerpt, from the Katta Salit Sagara. Sanskrit name for Ocean of Streams of Story. Book 9, chapter 56. It is for you, if you want to check, it is here available at the same society library. In translation, so the story is a very long story, convoluted story about a Brahmin named Shanda Swamin who is in search of his son and daughters. From India, he has to travel to Suvanadwipa, to the Golden Islands, in search of his lost children. Okay? And on the way, things happen, and he's meeting people, and so on. And here, Shanda Swamin, the main character of the story, had spent the night, looked up at him, he made acquaintance with a merchant named Vishnu Valman, who was about to go to the isle or islands of Narikela. And then he embarked on the ship and he started his sea journey to Suvanadwipa. So I got interested, of course, about the single occurrence of a Vishnu Valman that I could find in Indian literature from the first uh, This text is thought to be composed in the 11th century, so it's quite late for my purpose, but most scholars think that these stories, actually they're not just one, but many stories collected in many books, came from earlier stories, that another, uh, other texts that are today lost, okay? So it's not just brand new stories, but just a rewrite or some uh, um, new versions of older stories. And this is a map here that I took from the great book by Professor Whitley, The Golden Cursonais, where, so here you have to turn your head around. North is here. This is Jambudwipa here, India, Sri Lanka. The islands of Narikela, the coconut islands, Dwipa islands, Narikela coconuts, are uh, known most likely for Nicobar islands in the uh, uh, Indian Ocean. So this is Narikela islands, and this is where the main character of that story met a certain Vishnu Valman, a merchant, a mariner, most likely. Okay? And then, Vishnu Valman disappeared, we don't know what happened with him in a story. Never mind, because we know that later the main character embarked upon another ship for Katahadwipa. Katahadwipa most likely is another name for Kedah today, Kedah province in Malaysia. So 
basically Suva Nadwipa, the Golden Islands. And then he's taken to other islands and stories happen. So, coming to an end, so after all this investigation, um, some tentative conclusion. There is nothing firm here. In the end, although it would have been great to assume that these two characters are one and the same, I doubt this is the case. So my argument, my interpretation of things is that we are dealing here with one original, most likely Indian foreigner who made his way to Perak, where um, that seal was found, Kuala Selissing today in the state of Perak, Malaysia. Although you could claim that actually this sealing is not from there, it could have been moved to another place. Yes, of course. But let's uh, assume that the provenance is more or less correct. And if this was a traveler, most likely it was a merchant or a trader of some kind. Kings do not travel. You do not see a king from India traveling to Southeast Asia just like that, okay? So who, who travel basically? Merchants. And it is true, later on, some Brahmins did travel, even though it, it is technically forbidden for them to cross the sea. Some made their way across the ocean, we know that, and most likely some Buddhist monks as well. Okay? But I doubt this Vishnu Valman was a monk, Indian monk. I don't think he was a Brahmin in this case. Most likely, being the owner of a seal, he was probably a trader. So coming from India, that is my interpretation. And then, uh, around the same time, of course, we cannot be sure of the chronology here, then we would have further up in Klong Tom, what is today Krabi, another, in this case, what I take to be a local ruler, taking the name, kind of trendy at the time, because we have seen other examples in India, at least three of them, in Sanskrit, of Vishnu Valman. It was not the only uh, Valman named kings, there were others, but Vishnu Valman was part of the lot, kind of trendy. And it kind of disappeared from Indian epigraphy after the 5th century, for some reason. He was protected by Vishnu. Why did he do that? We can just assume that uh, to f f f uh, search for some legitimacy uh, from abroad, and why do I assume that this one must have been a local ruler? Um, the main argument is that the name is found on the reverse of coins, gold coins. And not anyone can inscribe his name on the back of his coin, right? You must have been someone important, either a prince or king or ruler of that area, so you could, you could strike money with your names on it, and possibly your face, your portrait. So perhaps the head in profile that we see on the obverse is basically a portrait of that ruler. This is all speculative, I assume, but these are some possibilities. And in terms of chronology, given the examples, epigraphic examples, and onomastic practices that we have seen and observed from Jambudwipa. I think it is quite fair to say that we should come up with a proposal that these uh, golden coins from Klongtom with inscriptions should be dated not as early as the second, third century common era as uh, it has been proposed by my colleagues, but a bit later, a bit later to around the fifth to the sixth centuries, okay? Main reason is if you study the onomastic practices, basically there is no Vishnu Valman known in Indian history, with one exception from uh, Gandhara, very remote time and space. With that exception, 
The other occurrences come from the 5th century, from the Kanamba dynasty, the Olikara dynasty, and Pallava dynasty in mostly southern India, fifth, mid-5th century. How could this Vishnu Valman in Southeast Asia be the name, be adopted, if there is no precedent in India? And this is not the only example. I've given you the example of Mahindra Valman, Vishva Valman, there seem to be this uh, contemporaneity between examples in India and almost at the same time, but certainly not before, uh, examples of Southeast Asian rulers and kings adopting these Sanskrit names, trendy, that are trendy in India. Okay? So I think here we have uh, perhaps another methodological means to look at the names and the onomastic practice and see perhaps if it can help in terms of chronology. And this is what I'm proposing here to conclude. And to finish, so if I am correct, this local Indianized ruler adopting for the first time in a region, perhaps more evidence will come up in the future, but for now, this will be the first and the earliest ruler found in today Thailand uh, by a royal Indic name ending by Valman, protected by. And later on, uh, actually there are not many, many cases in, in Thailand, so this is certainly the first and the earliest. Okay? So in this case, protected by Vishnu. And we have to remember, if you look into the wider picture, I'm myself not historian, more than epigraphist. It is in the Malay Thai Malay Peninsula that we find the earliest images of Vishnu ever in Southeast Asia. These are some examples. God Vishnu in one avatar or another. And uh, on basis of style, mostly, iconography and style, it is now dated from 500 onwards, so mostly first half of the 6th century. And these detailed studies have been done and agreed by different scholars, including one of my friends. If you look, if you do have the book Before Siam, which I have edited many years ago, there is a chapter by Paul Levy, a friend of mine, an art historian from Hawaii University, and in his chapter, he studies specifically these early images and compare with other examples from Funan, from Okeo, from Indonesia. And his conclusion is that this must be dated from 500 onwards. Even though back in the 70s, certain Stanley O'Connor from Cornell University did publish his uh, book on the Brahmanical gods from the time Malay Peninsula, and at the time, he thought that this would be earlier, from the 3rd to the 4th century. But now, we push back the chronology to more cautiously to, in this case, the 6th century. So the point is that, possibly, the picture we have now, at this time, is that a wave of Indianization, let's say, let's call it, a strong wave of Indianization came up around the 5th century, perhaps could pinpoint mid-5th century, in the 420s, 430s. We certainly have here and there hints in uh, Chinese sources of missions sent by certain Pishabamo. Pishabamo is certainly is a king ending by Valman, that's for sure. Whether he is Vishva Valman or Vishnu Valman, never mind. 433, 436, we have that. And then we have other inscriptions relatively dated to the 5th and 6th century. So this is the picture we have now on epigraphic basis. And then slightly later come the sculptures. And then later, again, we start to find monuments dedicated to the god, temples, shrines, to mainly Vishnu, Shiva, and then, of course, the Buddha as well later on. Okay. And it looks like the Thai Malay Peninsula in those days was a kind of a relay of a place of a stopover in between India 
or the Indian subcontinent and China with the maritime traffic going both ways for merchant traders and of course Brahmins and monks who spread ideas and uh, iconography and all these things. Okay? So, in conclusion, thank you for your attention. These are my acknowledgements, people who helped me in preparing this paper. For, again, for more details and reference, uh, we are looking forward to the forthcoming issue of GSS. Thank you very much. That was, uh, you, you see what uh, detective work. These are really our needles in haystacks, aren't they? Because you have to trawl through uh, most of the literature of early India to get one three line passage. Okay. Um, questions, please. Questions. Go ahead. We, oh, one second. We've got a. What are onomastic practices? What does that mean? Uh, the usage of names, toponymy. How. When you look at the toponymy of a place, of a country, you look at the names. If, for, take the example of Thailand, Ayutthaya. Why is the city named Ayutthaya? Where does the name Ayutthaya come from? It's Sanskrit. Ayutthaya is in the uh, Ramayana, I think, and probably other uh, Indian epics, the city of Rama, Prince Rama, okay? So looking at these names, where they come from, the etymology and the history and what it carries, you know, you can make some historical assumptions and reconstructions and all that. Another example dear to me is Dvaravati. Dvaravati is another Sanskrit proper name. And we know, again, from the Indian epics, in this case more the Mahabharata, great Indian epic, that Dvaravati was the city of Krishna. Krishna being the eighth avatar of Vishnu, and so on and so forth. So if you're looking at these names, the uh, etymology and so on, perhaps you could draw a picture and make some historical interpretation on it. So in this case, in case of uh, numismatic an epigraphy, I was trying to look for examples of Vishnu Valman elsewhere, okay? And I couldn't come up with any examples from Southeast Asia, as I said, mainland Southeast Asia. There's one example from Malaysia. But you have to look at the roots. This is Indic name, obviously. It must have come from India, from Indian subcontinent. So let's go back there and see what we find there. And I came up with four examples at least, uh, epigraphic example found on inscriptions. Uh, three of them from the fifth century, and that, that is almost it. And one reference from uh, uh, that Indian uh, stories of the ocean of streams, and that's almost it. Okay. And so, what they can, what can this tell us? How can you interpret it? So, so. Uh, okay. so also, you said, uh, I think you said Sri is a Shri. Mm -hmm. prefix? Yes. So that, how does that fit with Sri Lanka? I don't know how to translate Lanka. If he has, I don't think Lanka would have any, but yeah, Sri Lanka, the auspicious Lanka, island of Lanka, some, something like that. I don't think you can really translate Sri or Sri, but something auspicious, I would say. Thank you very much for a remarkable and memorable talk. Thank you. I really would like to know one thing. In both the flyer, where you speak of uh, Visubharma in Prakrit, and also in your talk, um, you mentioned the, the Prakrit, the word Prakrit, and you explained a bit about what a Prakrit is. And in one part, you said it's like Pali. And so my question is, is enough known about that script um, to say that it is not Pali? 
So do you know anything more that you could tell me from having consulted your other friends? It's yeah. very fascinating to me because I have studied Bali. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm not exactly a linguist myself and uh, a Pali expert. I did Pali as well and Sanskrit to a certain extent. So perhaps I'm not the most uh, uh, acquainted to answer this question here, but I will try. Um, it's not me who say this is Prakit, it's Professor Folk, and I believe him. <laughs> Professor Ari Folk, uh, if you know of him. He's not retired, but he still does some work. Um, what is Pali, is the question, main question. I mean, I have had this discussion over time with many scholars, and everyone has a different interpretation. Pali, Bali, uh, originally is not the name of a language. Pali just means language, actually. Bali Pasa, the pure, the, the beautified language in, in Pali canon, right? It's only, I think, in the 11th or second millennium, somewhere in the second millennium, that uh, we identify the language that is used in a canon in Sri Lanka as being a separate, distinct Pali language. But actually it's the same family of in middle Indo-Aryan language. Generic term for that is Prakrit. But I should have, we should have a plural here. There is not just one Prakrit, there are many, many, many Prakrits. Gandhari from Gandhara is one Prakrit. Okay, this is one variant. So there are as many different Prakrits in India as there are, you know, of uh, regions and uh, so, but it's same family, same what, what they call, the language called Middle Indo-Aryan language. Okay? And Sanskrit then is a very uh, normified, uh, how do you say, norm, um, very strict, very organized language, which they call perfect, okay? But Prakrit, Sanskrit, Pali, of course. If you know one language, you are uh, conversant with the other. I mean, and very often, in fact, the epigraphies, the scribe, when they write inscriptions or when they write manuscripts in those days, they make me what we call today, we interpret as mistakes. Uh, you say, this is not pure Pali that I learned, or this is not the pure Sanskrit that we know of from Panini. And so uh, epigraphist scholars came up with the term hybrid. Hybrid Prakrit, hybrid epigraphical Sanskrit, hybrid Pali even. Because very often it's not clear cut. Sometimes you have Pali with a shade of Sanskrit in there or Prakrit with some Sanskrit influence and so on and so forth. So we can just imagine that those people in early days were conversant with many languages Sanskrit, some kind of Sanskrit, some kind of Prakrit, and they would be able to communicate that way. Okay? Uh, I don't know enough to say that this uh, Vishuvama, as, that has been read uh, from those uh, coin in Krongtom, could be interpreted as some kind of Pali. Okay? I'd, I don't think we can say that. But again, it comes up to the question, what is Pali? And it's safer to say Prakrit because Prakrit is a generic term, okay? But usually, what maybe you and I understand today as Pali certainly was used only, as far as I know, and still is today, only for religious and Buddhist purposes from a certain school that we call the Theravada today. So this is just a seal or a coin. There's no reason why someone would have his name inscribed in Pali on the back, especially if he was a king. Sanskrit basically was, from that period onwards, the language of the gods and kings. But here we have, interestingly, we have an example of Prakrit, Sanskritized Prakrit. So it's not quite Sanskrit, it's a little bit blurred, but that makes it interesting as well. Thank you. Uh, 
since the coin is found at Kong Thom we in Krabi, mm -hmm. are there other archaeological artifacts that were found there or any remain to suggest that there might have actually been a kingdom, the physical you know, existence of anything at all? Uh, yes, a lot of material came up from this uh, site called Kwan Lukpat or Klong Tom. This is one example that I've shown. These are, in this table, you find a list of seals that are inscribed with proper names okay, of such and such person found in Klong Tom, Kwan Lukpat. Okay. And some other uh, small, usually small, not very impressive, material, beads, and early, early things, early artifacts. But no sculpture mm -hmm. of Vishnu or gods. No okay. walls or I don't think so. The, I don't think so. The problem is that this site, Kwanukpat, uh, has not been uh, properly excavated, unfortunately. Okay? There's been some attempts in the early 80s, but not, not well, not and, and, so, uh, and a lot of this material has been looted, actually. So we lost the uh, archaeological context, unfortunately. But I'm sure there is more to find around there. And to the question, yes, now that we have these golden coins with inscriptions, with probably the name of a ruler, then we could hypothesize that, there, yes, there was kingdom maybe a bit speculative, but some polities there. Okay, but we don't know the name. You know, if you if you look at the if you look at the reports from there, um, we always want to find kings and kingdoms, but it may have just been a trading settlement. You don't we don't you don't need kings. You know, you can actually have settlements and. Um, and several of the, there's, there's many of these new sites being found on the peninsula in the last 20 years. And uh, a lot of them you know, do look much more like sort of offshore production sites, you know, than they look like kingdoms, that they're producing beads and glass and all kinds of things like that. Yeah? So. And very often with most likely some foreign resident population coming from most likely India, but probably other places as well. I, I hope this was clear enough. It's quite technical, so I try to. <laughs> well, please join me in thank you. thanking me for that. It was really fascinating.